right, in this video, we're gonna look at vector valued functions. This goes along with section 3.1 from the OpenStax textbook calculus volume three. So for these vector valued functions, we want to be able to evaluate them, find their domain, graph them and take limits. So what is a vector value function gonna look like? Well, it looks a lot like the setup for a vector and we can use component form or we can use the basis vectors i, j, or i, j, and k. It could be in two dimensions or three dimensions, um, but instead of these components uh, being constants, they're now functions of some parameter t. So you take the three or two parametric equations and you just put them together into a function, or sorry, into a vector. <coughs> Um, and so this should look a lot like what we saw in section 1.1, uh, where you just take the pair or set of three parametric equations, and then these become the components in the vector. And that's a vector valued function. So a vector valued function will graph out the same way the parametric equations will uh, in two dimensions, a plane curve and three dimensions, a space curve. And at any given point, the vector value is a vector from the origin that points to that point on the curve. So when t is zero, uh, then you're at the point four zero and the vector goes from the origin to four zero. When t is pi over four, right, then the vector goes from zero to this point on the curve. Similarly, in three dimensions, uh, we have our three parametric equations. These become the three components in the vector, and you get a vector valued function to trace out a space curve. There's a little GeoGebra calculator here. It just shows how, if you wanted to graph these, how that could be typed in uh, to GeoGebra to plot. Now we said we wanted to be able to evaluate these functions. And just like other functions, evaluating means replacing the input with some specific constant. Our input now is the parameter t. And so using function notation uh, r of 2 pi over 3, we would just replace all the t's with 2 pi over 3. Now instead of getting a single value, like a scalar, out of what you would with a regular function, you now get a vector out. But notice the result is a constant vector instead of a vector that has the parameter t. So the value of the vector value function at a given time is some vector. Um, putting in a specific time gets you a specific constant vector. Otherwise, you're just evaluating the three functions and keeping them as separate pieces of the vector. Why don't you practice that with this vector valued function here uh, to find r of 0. Right. So you should have found that r of 0 is b uh, equal to 4j. And when some of the components are 0, you can just drop them. I've written them all here, um, but you could have just said 4j. Is this equivalent to 4j here? Answer choice b. Um, now, each of these functions may have some restrictions on its domain, and therefore the overall function may have a restricted domain. Uh, for instance, if we took this vector value function and tried to put in t as pi over 2, uh, then we get tangent of pi over 2 and secant of pi over 2, uh, and those don't exist uh, since cosine of pi over 2 is 0. You'd be dividing by 0. So that number is not in the domain. In general, if you're trying to find the domain of a vector value function, you just find the domain of each individual piece and then look for the intersection of those domains. Now you get more into calculus in the next section, but we can go ahead and do the limit here. Uh, if the limit as t approaches a of the vector valued function r is equal to L, then that means that uh, the limit of the magnitude of the r vector function and the L vector, right? L is a vector now. Um, the magnitude of the difference of those vectors is zero. Uh, so what that actually means is that you need each of the individual component functions to converge to the limit value. 
Uh, so you see here, you're basically distributing the limit to the different component functions in two dimensions. We could use f and g in three dimensions, f, g, and h. Um, and that's how we would actually take the limit of those. And then for these individual functions, just do the limit uh, techniques and definition from calculus one. Once you have limits in place, you can then uh, set up a similar definition to continuity. You should recognize these three properties as being the same as those for continuity of a function of a single variable, uh, that you need the function to have a value there to exist at the point, you need the limit to exist, and then you need the limit to match the value of the function. All right, and that's it for this section. Uh, this presentation by Matthew Watts contains images and text from Calculus Volume 3 by OpenStax, authored by Jed Herman, M.G. Strange, CC by NCSA.